Hi, I'm Preston Williams, and welcome to another edition of Jazz Talk. Today on our show, we are joined by a legend, a music icon. This young lady has been on the scene for over 60 years and has worked with many greats from Stan Getz to Chick Corea, Jaco Pastorius, The Grateful Dead, and George Duke, to name a few. She is a vocalist, songwriter, and has been called by many the queen of Brazilian jazz, and I concur. Please welcome to Jazz Talk, the legendary Miss Flora Perrin. Welcome. Thank you, Preston. Thank you for the young lady, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so good to have you on. As, I, as you and I were just chatting uh, before the st uh, show started, uh, you were on about a month and a half ago when we were talking about Tony Williams and right. uh, uh, you just, you know, you guys knowing him and working with him. But I'm so glad to have you on today. And I want to talk, uh, get started and talk about your humble beginnings, your background. Now, I understand that you're from uh, Rio de Janeiro. And uh, I understand also that your parents were classical musicians. Father played violin and your mother piano. Tell me about that. That's right. No, they, that's how they met, actually. Uh, they were playing in some orchestra. And, and my father was just in... Uh, from uh, Russia, actually, and my mother was from Northeast Brazil, ah. and he didn't speak any Portuguese, and di she didn't speak any Russian either. So they communicated in Yiddish, which is a Jewish German dialect, you know. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. And no, uh, it was interesting because they raised three kids: me, my sister, and my brother. Uh -huh. between the two of them not speaking a word of Portuguese. I, I did study some Russian because I wanted to, to communicate with him in his language, but he was so burned out for having to escape uh, the war and, and he never wanted to know, never wanted us to know how was it and how was his home. And he, he rejected to tell us a lot about the past also because he was afraid because mm. at that point uh, Brazil had the Nazi flag up uh, among the other flags uh, whenever they have like a, uh, a convention or something real big you know mm -hmm. so they were they escaped I mean my mother didn't have to escape but my, my father did escape and my mother was already in Brazil. She was born in Brazil, parents from Switzerland. So thank God she learned languages and she could play and they met because they were wonderful parents, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, one of the things that I liked, uh, I read a story that when your father was at work, your mother would play jazz records in the house, <laughs> like, like Earl Garner and Oscar Peterson and stuff like that. So right. you were exposed to this. I was, I was, was, and it, and 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 it was so good, you know. Um, I really fell in love with jazz for the improvisation side of it. It, mm -hmm. it really took me. I I liked all, all kinds of music. Yeah. I liked very rehearsed and tight music, like with Chick. I had we had like. Uh, a month of eight hours rehearsal, including on Sundays, every every day. And even though the music seemed easy to people, it was difficult to play that music. Yeah. So, but Chick's goal was, let's make the difficult sound easy so people can duplicate. And that that was also one of the reasons he. He had me on vocals before he'd never had a vocalist before me. Yeah. And uh, he was very uh, sad because he wanted people to duplicate the music, yeah. to be able to hum a melody or, or sing a couple of notes here and there. And he realized that just playing free form wouldn't do that. So when he made the decision to go to write the first two records, which was the original Return to Forever and second Light as a Feather, mm -hmm. the original band he had that was called Circles. Yeah. They 
they jumped off the wagon. You know, that was like did. that was like avant garde with Anthony Braxton. That group that they had that was something else. Yeah, it was. It, I loved that group I very much. Too. And Dave Holland and oh man, just I had so many long uh, encounters with Dave Holland. He loved Brazilian music and he played real good acoustic guitar. And he was very interested on Milton Nascimento's music. Yes. So he used to play songs for me on the guitar. Said, How about this one? How about that one? I said, this yeah. is wonderful. How did you hear this? When did you hear this? He said, wow, I, I searched for it. I, I am into it. And slowly, I mean, how I got really close to Chick. When Chick was playing with Miles, so was I used to. So we used to, I used to uh, ride with the band on a bus and mm. Chick and Kit Jarrett, they were both in this lineup. Yeah. And that's how I met originally. I mean, not the very first time I saw Chick, I didn't pay attention to him. He was uh, a sideman for Mongo Santa Maria. That's right. And I, I went there to see Thelonious Monk, which was the main main uh, act of the night. So later on, I realized he was the keyboard player with Mongo Santa Maria. And um, the second time I, I met Chick a little deeper was when we were on the bus uh, on the Miles Davis tour. Wow, amazing, amazing. Now, Flora, I wanted to go back a little bit uh, to the 60s. I guess when you're honing your your voice, you know, you're getting it together and you're singing as a teenager. Um, and you were singing, I guess, a little bit of uh, Bossa Nova. That was it, Flora E M P M. That uh, you know, when you were singing around that time in the '60s. I guess that was just before you met uh, Erto. But I guess during that time, were you sort of singing uh, jazz tunes and mixing them with protest songs? Yeah, yeah, because um, I was de developing my skills on acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. And that was the only thing I could do it that was available to me, you know, by learning how to play acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. The bossa nova compositions where the easier for me was the natural way to go. And, and in fact, when I arrived in America, uh, it was post bossa nova. Yeah. And, um, I used to meet the musicians later on at Walter Booker's house after the gigs. Everybody converged to Walter Booker. He was a bass player with Cannonball Island. Yes. And they have a guitar there and I picked up the guitar and played the songs and they were, wow, she can play, she can play. Let's hear this. Let's learn this song. Yeah. And um, I did spend one of those nights, I spent the whole night playing one song, the same song, over and over again, for Thelonious. And it's a song written by Eumi Deodato. And it's called, in English, it's called Little Tear. And in Portuguese, uh, Razão de Viver. Ah, interesting. Wow. You know, uh, I was also going to ask you, um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I was going to also ask you uh, an interesting story. I guess just before you came to the United States, uh, you used to sing at uh, the San Francisco River. Oh, that yeah. River. You would sing to that because yeah. I guess, you know, it, it's almost like you were thinking about, I guess, going to the United States and the, the way that the water uh, would flow like you were. Some, some story that I read about that, uh, that you would sing to the river. Tell me about that. Yeah, that's the true story. It's just like, um, uh, I would say uh, to San Francisco River, I knew all the rivers would end up in the ocean, you know, mm -hmm. and throughout the ocean, I'll, someday I'll get there, you know. And so I used to postulate, you know, that I will get there, you know, I don't know how and when, but I will get there. Will get and that, that was one of the first songs I kind of, wrote about it. Yeah. That's wonderful. Now, how did you, tell me again, how did you and Erto meet? Well, I 
I was hired by a, a club in Sao Paulo uh, called uh, João Sebastião Bar, mm -hmm. which was like a was like a joke of Johann Sebastian Bar. It was written in Portuguese instead of Johann was João, instead of Sebastian was Sebastião, which is a common name in Brazil. Mm -hmm. In bar, it's like a, a bar where you drink, you know. B A R. I was hired by this club, and uh, they were four singers in four groups, and the owner assigned the groups uh, to the singers, and they assigned me some balance trio, which was the trio that I used to was the drummer with. Mm -hmm. That's how I met I. Ah, interesting. You know, speaking of uh, your husband. Well, I guess one of the first times, uh, Flora, that I became aware of him is playing in that Miles Davis group, especially the Bitches Brew recording. You know, all the musicians mm. got some exposure on that one. I mean, it seems like everyone who played on that record with Miles became a star in their own right. And uh, right. that was probably my first time uh, seeing him. Now, I guess now, how did you get to, to work with uh, Stan Getz and, and uh, um, was Gil Evans? Well, um before before I I got to work with Stan Getz, mm -hmm. um I used to and I and Ernesto Pascual, a Brazilian musician, yeah. uh we 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 got a, we got signed to a label called Buddha Records and we Buddha. did we were supposed to do each one of us a record. So we started with the uh, I used to record called uh, Seeds of Natural Feelings. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Gil heard that record, somebody played it for him. He made a point of find out who we were, we were and called us and, and tell us how he felt about the music, how fresh it was to him. And he actually told me to tell Hermeto Pascual that he put it too much in one record. He could have made three records with all the material he put in one record. Mm. So every time I, I played in New York, Gil will come up and sit in the middle of the audience, pay to come in, not even ask for a, a, nothing and watch the show. And after the show, we'll go and talk to us. So. We became so close and he actually asked us to join him, to join, join his band. He had a band, uh, at that time, the big bands were on in New York. And um, uh, uh, Didi Bridgewater used to sing with the Mel Lewis and- um, at, at, at that Jones. Right, that was a big band. And, Gil used to rehearse his band down in his basement, but he had the Monday night uh, at Floods or somewhere somewhere else in New York. And we singers would go to each other's gigs in the break to see what each other were doing. And uh, I I feel blessed to to have had uh, Gil many times over in my musical life. You know, he was a counselor. Uh, he also helped to arrange Aito's Brazilian Spiritual Mass recorded with the WDR Orchestra of Cologne. He, he was supervising Marcos Silva. Marcos wrote the arrangement and I used to wrote the, the arrangement. I used to actually sing what he wanted to Marcos. Marcos would orchestrate and Gil would look over and say, oh, why don't you add a, a tuba to his, this bass line? And that was wisdom, you know, wisdom from the past because jazz in the past, they used the tuba a lot yes. to replace the bass, you know? So we wouldn't have that wisdom if, if Gil wouldn't tell us the story, you know, and we yeah. follow that. But uh, going back to the original questions, it's like um, you, you were asking me, how did uh, uh, I, I, I met Stan Getz? 
It yes. was like I was at Walter Booker after the gig again. I was gigging with uh, Reggie Workman. Reggie is a bass player that worked with Alice Coltrane and John Coltrane. And he was doing a club, a club a lounge date. And I, I was just starting in New York and I was grateful I got that gig. And after one week, he told Aito and I, I wanna take you somewhere. And he took me by the first time to this jams that happened after the gigs at Walter Booker's home. And one night, Stan Getz came over. Many other greats would come over, you know. Uh, Charlie Rouse would come over. Um, Richard Davis would be there. Art Blake he would be there. Ken Bauer would be there. Nat Ali would be there. George Duke would be there. I mean, I, I was so lucky, Preston. I was so lucky. I was young. I was in my early 20s when I got there. And I walked with the giants, you know, they were giants. That's incredible. Now, yeah, one of the things that I found interesting, I, I read somewhere that you, speaking of Gil Evans, you there's a particular record that you always have by your bedside. I think it's called Miles Ahead. That's one of the records. <laughs> That's right. Miles yeah. Ahead plus 19 with yeah. Gil's arrangements. Um, that's one of my favorites. It still is, you know, yeah. still is. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually, not too long ago, I mean, not, not about 10 years ago, 15 years ago or something, I recorded an, an album. I don't recall the name right now. I did so many. And I actually picked up my ship, which was a, a, a I think it was a, a Broadway musical. I don't know who who, uh, who wrote the song at this minute. I can't remember the name of the guy. Anyway, it's my ship. I think it's on the record. Um, it's on the record. No, it's not Speak No Evil. It's the next one. Oh, can you dig it? it, it I don't it'll, it'll come to you. It'll come it. to you. Don't think about it. It'll come to you. <laughs> That happens sometimes, okay. but but uh, but yeah, like I said, uh, as you said, you walk with the giants, being associated with those people. You know, as you and I were talking about Chick Corea, you were around a young, vibrant Chick Corea. You know, uh, when he was forming yeah. uh, the very first version of uh, Return to Forever with you know Joe Farrell and you guys. Right. And tell, me, tell me the story about Five Hundred Miles High because that's a very special song, and just hearing you sing on that still to this day. For I mean, it was made what. 50 plus years ago, and it still holds up. Tell me about that song and how it came to be. Well, that's that's what happened. Then after after Miles, just just think about if you were a young musician mm -hmm. and you played with Miles, where do you go from there? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so every member of, of that band, Kit Jarrett, Chip Corea, uh, Dave Holland, they all found their own niche and they, yes. they, they founded their own bands, each one of them. Mm -hmm. They began playing their own music with yeah. new musicians, young upcoming musicians. And uh, that's when Chick started writing the songs that he wanted people to, to learn and yes. to know, and he offered the songs to a few singers and they all declined. They said, uh, well, we can't, we can't take a chance because we are settled on swing and bebop and, and this is fusion. This, they, they didn't even call it fusion. This is too new for us. But the fact is that when Chick, wrote those songs yes he didn't realize first of all that he never wrote for singers before so he would pick keys like 500 miles high was in g you know it was really really high uh, but I, I was so young and i could 
use my falsetto and, and hit the notes. Mm -hmm. And I was not treated as like the singer with the band. I was just like another member of the band. Mm -hmm. So after trying a few drummers that also didn't want to play that kind of music, he asked me to ask Faye to, to sit in on drums until he finds a drummer. So as I used to was on the break from Miles, he said, okay, I'll I'll sit in for rehearsals. And after two or three rehearsals, he said, ask him. he wouldn't tell. I used to personally, he was very afraid of rejection. Mm -hmm. he, he told, ask I used to 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 stay to come and play with us. Yes. In the first song he he played for me it was 500 miles high. So I went to his apartment, um, three floors up, sat in, he played the melody. There were no lyrics there. And I said, what and what am I supposed to sing here? He said, just vocalize it. Can you do it? I said, yeah, I can do it. But it's going to, I, now I understand why the other singers didn't want to take it, you know? I mean, if you are established, like Carmen McRae or Ella or Sarah or Ness, you have your, your trademark songs. And why would you sit in with a, a song with no lyrics, you know? So I took the challenge on stride because to me that every single little thing was a learning experience. To me, just going through that was learning and learning. And boy, how I love to learn. That's such a great feeling when you actually get a piece of information that you can use mm -hmm. throughout your life in any kind of music you, you engage. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that I like about you, Flora, is that you're very open too. And maybe Chick sensed that, like, he's probably thinking, I bet you Flora can sing this, you know? So. No, that's why he gave it to you and had you sing it. And that, that's beautiful. I wanted to talk about your uh, debut recording. I wanted to talk about Butterfly Dreams. Tell me about that. What, 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 what were you trying to say in that? What was the, the story behind that? What is Butterfly Dreams? Well, at that time, uh, right before Butterfly Dreams, we, I was with Chick for almost three years. You know, mm -hmm. and, and he found a young bass player in Philadelphia named Stanley Clark. Yeah. Stanley was not even finished with high school and he dropped out to John Chick. So after, so uh, I became real close to Stanley and his wife, Carolyn, mm -hmm. because Chick asked us, we used, Chick didn't have a place to live. I mean, his, his flat was only a studio flat. So he asked us to take Stanley and Carol until things got better. Mm -hmm. So Stanley and, and his wife came live with us in one bedroom apartment wow. on, on um, 72nd Street, Central, near Central Park, next to the Dakota Street, which John Lennon used to live. You know, and we used to see John Lennon all the time. Anyways, just going back in my life, no, so I am good. I like tripping this. here. See? So, yeah, uh, tell me more about uh, Butterfly Dreams. How Butterfly you Dream. So Stanley, Stanley wrote this composition. It was one of his first compositions. And then when I left Chick, I sat in with Carlos Santana. Yeah. I, I mean, I, we, Ayrton and I had the group we formed to do that record. And we played at Keystone Corner, which was a very celebrated jazz club in San Francisco. And Carlos used to come to see us every night. And one night, he, after the gig also, he said, would you mind coming back to, coming with me to the studio where I'm recording an album? And we never really sleep after the gig because you have all that adrenaline going. And 
it takes a couple of hours, two, three hours for you to come down. A lot of coffee, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we went to the studio with Carlos and the record was already made. And um, the first thing he asked I used to, to play in one song and he played the song. And I just said, and what's wrong with the song? I hear the drummer is playing real good. And uh, the drummer was Michael Shriff. Mm -hmm. And the song was, I think it was uh, Welcome. I, I think it was Welcome. So the keyboard player was named Richard Kermode. He wrote this melody and the rhythm called Yours is the Light. Mm -hmm. So Carlos asked me to sing the song. So I, I got the lyrics. Because I, I, I started to tell you that I went to jam with Carlos after that. And Ralph Gleason, this um, incredible jazz connoisseur, wrote a review about uh, us in the jam on a, on, at the concert the, at the art museum in San Francisco, not San Francisco, was in Berkeley. And he said, A Star is Born was the title <laughs> of the, the thing. And he's talking about me. And the next thing that happened, I, I left Chick and I immediately got a, a record deal with Fantasy Records, Milestone. Yes. And the producer was Orin Kipnus. That's right. He was the, on, the original owner of Milestone and sold the, the label to Fantasy that took several other labels. And they offered me a record deal and I, I went on and I did Butterfly Dreams. Wow. Wow. I tell you, so many great artists are on that label. Another person I can think of too that had a big outpouring on that was McCoy Tyner. He recorded like yeah. Stone. Yeah. I have a lot of recordings with him too. But no, that's a great record. And uh, you know, you just brought up someone's name. Uh, I was just talking about you Friday night. I'm good friends with the owner of Keystone Corner, Todd Barkin. And I yeah. told him I'm gonna be talking to you on Sunday. He says, Flora and Erito. He was like really excited about it. So you guys have to come to the United States to perform. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna be there today. Uh, Keystone Corner moved to Baltimore. It's only like 15 minutes from me. So if you guys ever come to the United States, please come to Keystone Corner, Flora. Would love to see you in Erito. That would be wonderful. Oh, I, I, we, are plan we, we have some offers uh, to do a series in the west coast um actually is the, the name of this series is uh, jazz is dead okay but it's, it's not he doesn't mean jazz is dead right. actually the label is like music music don't sleep is something like that yeah. and the promoter he's been talking to me for the last three years and uh we never Schedules didn't match up, things didn't match up. Now on top of this, he not he just he he doesn't just want a concert or two. He wants to us to go on studio with another two musicians from the Middle East mm. and do a, a recording of brand new music. And this this for us is like a couple of weeks, you know. And uh, we have to adjust times. And as soon as people know we are in the US, they start calling us a lot, a lot. And some of them, like Todd Barton, are great old friends of us. That it's hard for us to say, we can't do this now. <laughs> we cannot go coast to coast as we used to. We used to, to work four months on the road and not go home, just sleep on the bus. Yeah. Hardly take flights only if they were overseas, you know. And uh, the, the record companies would provide us at that time with a lot of budgets for, for touring and promoting. Mm -hmm. And uh, the buses would have beds and kitchens and, and all kinds of services and roadies and road managers. And, and the stage would travel with us, you know, in another truck behind the bus. Yeah. That's a major 
major production, you know. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Now yeah. and nowadays, I don't think they do this much more unless they do it for the big rock rock bands. Yeah, yeah. Which are not that many around anymore. Just few of them. Some of them scale. Well, I'll tell you, back in the 70s, there was one band that had many tractor trailers. They were huge, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire. They used to put on a big show back in the, the 70s and uh, talk That's about right. the, you know, they were- I'm talking to you. I know, I know them all because when we went to the West Coast, we used to stay at the, um, we used to live in New York. Mm -hmm. So if we, I, I was hired to, to sing on the movie soundtrack called Le Biche, a French movie. Like yes. by Claude Chabrol, and we they put me in this hotel called uh, the the Sunset Marquee Hotel, and Earth, Wind, and Fire used to stay there, and uh, Bat Midler used to stay there. Mm -hmm. uh, many, many, many groups, like <laughs> it used to be like you were in a recording studio because there was a swimming pool, and daytime. If you work at night, if you have a swimming pool, you just, the West Coast, the weather was great. You just go in, you know? So yeah. I, I, I met Maurice White, mm -hmm. uh, who invited me to one of the apartments and introduced me to the rest of the band. And actually, when I was working with George, uh, I was doing a record called Carry On and George produced it and he had Alger Row on it. Oh, and the, the Warner Brothers wanted a single. And George told me, I'm going to talk to, to Earth, Wind, and Fire. I said, You're kidding me. You're going to ask them to write a single? No, I know them. I, can't, I think I'm going to talk to Roland, Roland Bautiste. Yeah, Roland which Bautiste. Was a, so Roland actually wrote a single called Angels. Mm. But it was very much in the pocket. Like the was a bad bit to it. It, it. it forced you in, inside of the friend. Mm -hmm. I sang it two or three times in the beginning of the tour, but I, I wouldn't get off on it because I couldn't improvise on that same repetitious thing. And that's, how singles took off, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. So like on the fourth concert, fifth concert, I didn't sing. And on the sixth concert, I got a message from Warner Brothers. <laughs> Why are you not singing the single? I, and I couldn't even respond to them. You know, I didn't want to put it down. I just told them, well, I, I have to feature every musician and then they all master musicians. They're not my side men. They are, they are my side men, but they are side by side with me. I'm not in front of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I tried to explain this to the company and they wouldn't take it. You know, they, they got really upset with me with that one, you know. In fact, because my budgets were very, very big. Yeah. And I had a, four, a, a fourth deal album. I did three on the fourth album they had to put out something like a half a million dollars for the production. Mm -hmm. And at that time, George Benson took off. They bought George Benson from CTI, or they got it on a deal. And uh, Al Jiro was taking off. The yeah. two of them took off. It's the mid seventies like that. Yeah. Um, late seventies. So, when they came to me and said, we want you to be our George Vance, and I was I said, guys, <laughs> I went to a CEO meeting. There was like 20 guys around a huge table and me and my man. And I told them, first of all, I, I was scared of that meeting. I said, what am I doing here? But I, I, was, I was kind of uh, pleading my case, you know, First of all, I told them, I know it worked out with those two guys because they are American. They are black American guys. 
I am a white Brazilian Jewish girl. What are you doing with me? You know, I know you, you, you found me in the middle of the black neighborhood, but they were just my friends. You know, I was not trying to invade the, the culture. I was just learning from it, you know, yeah. and uh, I brought them back to reality. So on the fourth record, they paid me off not to do the record. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that, I, that's a story floor. I don't know if too many people would know that one. Wow, that's incredible. I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about uh, a wonderful musician. And last time uh, I chatted with you uh, about him, uh, one of my all time favorite musicians, bassist Jaco Pastorius. What was it like working with Jaco? Well, Jaco was like, I mean, I have no words to express. I, 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 told, I told you that Ron Carter is one of my mentors, along with yeah. George Duke yeah. and Hermeto and Wayne Schoeller. But when I first saw Jaco, he was on a weather report gig. And I was in the middle of the crowd watching the show. And they, they finished the show with the song Birdland. Yes. Which... It was a breathtaking composition anyways. But Jaco, first of all, he was playing fretless, which yes. hardly anybody did. Right. Second of all, the last, very last chord of the song, he would jump from one side of the stage to another side of the stage. <laughs> and by doing this, he would unplug the bass instantly. So that's ending. It was breathtaking, the whole thing. Yeah. Of he course, I went backstage. I was real close to Wayne Shaw. I learned from him a lot. We also used to hang out at um, Walter Booker's house. And um, I introduced myself to Jack, who spoke a little. And the next thing I see is Jack was coming to check us out in our gigs. And then one day we were recording one of Aisto's records called the, the Happy People. I, mm -hmm. No, I'm fine, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? And Jaco walk, walks in the, this really small studio. We, were, we, were, we already bass tracked everything. We were finishing up on top of the bass track on a smaller studio upstairs. And Jack was hanging out on the streets and found out we, we were there and walked in with his bass. And I used to said, wow, how good that you're here. I am one song short here. And Jack said, no problem. Got his bass out of the, the case and started to play freely. Mm -hmm. A song that the, afterwards, they were both playing free, I used to and Jaco. That's the closing song on I'm Fine, How Are You? And oh, it's called yeah. Nativity. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's great. Uh, I tell you, it's, it's a shame that uh, he wasn't with us longer because I just thought he was brilliant, not only as a player, but as a composer too. Jaco was brilliant. Oh, you know. he, he, he was everything. He, he played piano, he sang, he yeah. co-produced an album for me, an album that hardly anybody knows called Every Day, Every Night. Mm -hmm. He co-produced with Michel Colombier, a French yes. Um, yes. With musician. Mm -hmm. And he, he saw it through, I mean, every single cut of the tracks, uh, the, the, all the tracks, he, he went through all of it. He played in most of it. And uh, we got to hang out a lot at the Sunset Marquis, <laughs> the same hotel, you know? And, and I tell you that the original story of this one is, I, I, I came out of a meeting from another meeting with Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. I think it was the very first, the, the second meeting where he told me I have this much money to do an album. And I went back to the hotel and I had no music written, new music. I didn't want to do a record of old stuff. Right. And, I, 
And Jack was checking in at the hotel. And we met at the lobby and I said, Jesus, Jack, how good to see you. And I and he said, How how how's it going? I said, man, I got a problem. I said, What problem? I know I have this much money to do a record, and I, I have no music. And he said to me, this is no problem. I said, why do you mean this is no problem? Uh, call me in an hour. So I went, checked in, and I mean, I went to my room, he checked in. I called him in an hour and he said, I want you to meet somebody. He lived in the same street of the hotel down in the building here. Uh, so he told me the name of the guy which was Michel Colombier. Mm. Now, I knew this name from a record called, um, I think, Wings or something like that. It was a beautiful record, but I didn't know anybody there. I just, I was into it, listening to new music from Europe. Mm -hmm. So when he said Michel Colombier, I said to him, Wait a minute, can I bring somebody with me? He said, yes, who? I said, I want to bring, bring Herbie. Which Her Herbie Hancock? Yeah, Herbie Hancock. So I called Herbie, who lived down uh, three streets down. I said, Herbie, I have to meet this guy. His name is so-and-so. Would you come with me to this meeting? He said, yeah, I will. He joined me, and I went with Jaco and Herbie to meet Michel Colombier. So mm -hmm. we told him the story, the truth, you know, that I had no music and blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, give me about 48 hours. <laughs> we gave him 48 hours. In 48 hours, we went back and there he was with like 10 songs, newly written. Wow. Newly written. And I said, you're kidding me. And each song, one was better than the other. And Jaco said, I want to put my two cents in it too. Florida, would you sing this composition I wrote in Fort Lauderdale when I was in school, blah, blah. And you know, so what's the song about? He said, well, it's called Las Olas. Las Olas in Spanish means the waves. So I, okay, jump in the bed, I'll do the song. And I, I told Warner Brothers, I can't write music in, in, in here in LA. It's too much people coming in and out of the house, too much action. I've got to go somewhere. I want to go to Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. They said, okay, uh, we fixed everything up for you. And I was treated like a major star. Maybe I was a major star at that point. But... Um, they put me in this most expensive hotel called the Biltmore Hotel in Santa Barbara, not in a room, but in a bungalow with three rooms and two bathrooms mm -hmm. and gardens. And so I took my entire family with me, you know, and stayed there for a week. Wow. And while the family went to the beach and I was riding, riding, riding inside of the bungalow nonstop but I, I was so inspired by the whole thing, the fresh music. And unfortunately, that's, that's my album that sold less. Uh, uh, because the people that bought my music, they love the spontaneous thing, the, the improvisation, mm -hmm. the raw, the raw stuff. Mm -hmm. When they hear this whole arrangements, orchestra, strings recorded in London, horns recorded in New York. I am in LA. This was too much for the yeah. crowd. The crowd that used to see me at, at the Keystone Corner or Baker's Keyboard Lounge with Chico Rio, you know. Yeah, different. You Baker, know, like I said, Baker's is a good jazz club, by the way. It's in Detroit. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with it. I'm and, familiar with it. Yeah. Well, that's when I he, I heard Earl Clue okay. ask 
if he could play before the set, he wanted us to hear him. Mm -hmm. So he came in and played three songs before the set. Earl Clue, it's a wonderful guitar player. Yeah. We fell in love with him right away. It was like, oh, love at first note. <laughs> Yeah, he did a wonderful collaboration with George Benson. They put out a recording called Collaboration, which was very good, the two of them together. Yeah, he's a very great uh, Oh, at, at, in the 70s, you mean? Uh, no, this is actually the 80s. Uh, they put out 80s. a uh, recording in 88, 87 called Collaboration, which is very good. Oh, now, um, that I probably to ask sounds you, beautiful. Oh, it is. It's very, very good. Now, I wanted to ask you, how did you get to work, Flora, with the Grateful Dead? That was interesting for me. <laughs> Well, it was like um, uh, the drama with the Grateful Dead mm -hmm. had been one of the drummers. There were two drummers. This was uh, talking about Mickey Hart. There was Mickey Hart and Bill Crowton, you know, Kreitzman. So Mickey Hart, bef uh, Francis Ford Coppola bef befriended Mickey Hart, I mean, the Grateful Dead, the whole band, he used to go to their concerts. And at that point, he was trying to finish a film that he was doing for 10 years. And he was over budget. His house was being pawned, you know, because he wouldn't let the film go. He, he, the film was real close to his heart. Mm -hmm. And his father, Francis' father, was a, an Italian famous arranger named Carmine Coppola, who arranged many, many films. Mm -hmm. And he gave the soundtrack to his father, who wrote an arrangement for the film with strings and beautiful things and beautiful music. And when Francis heard the score against the images, he realized that the whole film takes place in the jungle where they're using napalm bombs to burn the jungles. And this is all re really savage, you know, and Marlon Brando and Mighty Shin and the whole plot. And Francis said, no, this music can't be, this music can't be, doesn't match. So without anybody knowing, he contacted Mickey Hart and told Mickey he wanted to have a soundtrack made of just percussion. Mm. So Mickey, well, we, we used to hang out, like San Francisco is not that big. It's big if you go out, out to Berkeley and other places, but everybody knows everybody. Like, if I even tell you that James Joplin once walked into this club, I was sitting by myself in the table watching Aito with Miles, and there was no empty table, so she approached and asked me if she could sit in with me. I didn't, I recognized her, but I didn't, I, I, I didn't want to bother her, so she sat with me, you know. So that's how small this whole, the music world was then, you know. So. Rock players would meet jazz players and vice versa. And um, going back to uh, uh, the soundtrack of Mickey Hart and Grateful Dead, Mickey called Michael Hinton. Michael Hinton was the chair drummer with the Lincoln, uh, I think Lincoln Center Orchestra. It was his childhood friend from school from kindergarten after, and together they called Ayrton. The three of them decided what sounds would go on, on, on the images that were yeah. sent to us, the roughs. And on the second day, um, Ayrton and Miki decided to call me, but I'm not, I mean, I could play percussion, but I was the only woman there. It was like a percussionist from Japan, from Venezuela, from Mexico, from China. It was taiko drummers from China were there. And there I was, you know. And why I was there? Because 
that I, I, I go back to my beginnings, uh, where I was told by Wayne Shorter and Hermeto Pascual to use my voice as an instrument, to use my voice for sounds, not just for singing mm -hmm. lyrics. And then take us all back to Chick Corea again. Mm -hmm. You know, she picked me out of the bunch, you know, because he probably heard me or heard of me, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so that's how I landed the, this gig with uh, uh, the Grateful Dead. In fact, every New Year's Eve being at the Grateful Dead show, which took eight hours, the show, like every hour on hour, a big name will come in and sit in with the Grateful Dead. Mm. And we will be one of the big names, you know. I'll yeah. bring in like my sound effects, such uh, an echoplex, which I learned from George Duke. Mm -hmm. It's a sound device that repeats, you know, that has a little tape, real old. They have digital ones, they're not as good as the old one because yeah. they, they don't have the noise. It, it requires the, <laughs> that, <laughs> that noise that old vinyls used to have. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. well, just talking to you now, I realize I, I, I broke some, some barriers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. You definitely did. Hey, tell me, what was it like working with Dizzy Gillespie? Ah, oh, well, Dizzy was also a master. Dizzy, again, there I was, the only woman with a big man. <laughs> And Dizzy was a total gentleman. Mm. He made sure that I would fly together with him on first class and stay on presidential suites. Like we, we took the road together with the United Nations Orchestra for mm -hmm. two years in a row. One of those tours that you never go back home. <laughs> so throughout the tour, as I said, after the gig, everybody goes to their rooms and Jesus, I need the bed. I want to take a bath and sleep tomorrow, eight o'clock in the morning, bus, you know? Yeah. And we couldn't sleep, Alisa and I. And Giovanni Hidalgo, was a, he was a percussionist with the band, one of the percussions. So I used to go to sleep, but Giovanni and I would run to Dizzy's room, sweet, and we sit there while this is putting away his clothes for the next trip, and this is telling us his life story. How was it in the 30s, in the 40s? How was to go through uh, no blacks allowed here, bathroom for whites and blacks, and Dizzy told us a story about one time they were after Billy Holiday and uh, they had to go through a lot of security and they stopped Billy and she had no drugs on her at that time, but they arrested her anyways. But they didn't take none of the other musicians. It was just for after her. Yeah. So learning, this story by somebody that actually lived it yeah. is different than reading it, you know? Right. It's, it's quite different. And here I am again, every one of these names that we talked about today, they taught me something. Yeah. Yeah, they're giants. Like I, I said, I, you, walk, you walk with the giants, Flora. You walk with the giants. And uh, to work with these people firsthand, that, that is tremendous. I mean, wow. And I guess you were with him, I guess the last three, four years or so of his life, because he passed, I think, in 93. Yes, yes. So, yes, you know, I was. I was. In he fact, was... Um, he, he had a problem in, in his pancreas. He, he was also diabet diabetic. He had diabetes. And usually, in big events like ours, the, the promoters will have a catering, big catering, like a 
not just dinner, uh, gourmet dinners, they will have like after dinner meals and sweets. And every time I saw Dizzy trying to put his hand on a sweet, I go, no, no, you can't, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> so I kept my eye on him yeah. and I, I would hang out with him until one, we, we stopped after two, two and a half years. In fact, I was, I was in Spain, was the last gig. And uh, I got a call from a promoter in Austria. I, I didn't get the call personally. The, the promoters of Dizzy got a call from the promoter in Austria to remind Aisha and I that we had a gig with him. Like if I, if I was going to forget. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't forget, but I didn't like that because the, the people from Dizzy's band took upon them that I, sh I should pay for it because they paid for my ticket first class all the way back and forth. So they took off my money uh, and I used to money a little bit. And I got really upset with that one because, you know, it's like a, I was making a lot of money. Yeah. I was, I, I did make, make a lot of money, but not because I was greedy. It just happened that I was doing something that they wanted. I wasn't like, a, they wouldn't offer me little money, never, ever. They would come to me with already big offers on the table. I didn't even need management to take to decide. Right. But at that point, I was going to stay in Spain, go to Austria. And, and then they took some money from me and I went and talk, talked to them. I said, hey, I've been, through this for months now, and we were a family. What are you doing? Oh no! When we talk about business, there's no family involved. Ah, okay. Then I learned the lesson. So that was one of my first lessons about mm. being greedy. You know. Oh man, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, I guess that's just part of uh, being in the in the business. Now, uh, over the years, Flora, you've won various awards, downbeat polls and awards. Tell me about this uh, award, this Lifetime Achievement Award that you won in 2002. Oh, that was the Brazilian God. Yes. Was like, uh, they, they checked out to see, they, they saw what, what was bringing Brazil to light was not just carnival, or soccer, like Pelé, you know, those, they were bringing Brazil up, but it was something else bringing Brazil up. The music of Brazil, the, the influence of Brazilian music on jazz, especially, yeah. Yeah. and the influence of Aisto's percussion on rock, because nowadays every rock band has a percussionist. Mm -hmm. In the past percussion, was like a congas, uh, timbales, bongos. Now, not the kind of percussion that I used to introduce. Yeah. Sorry, I got off. Opa. I think we finished. Uh uh. Yeah. What what happens now? Now you're you're sideways. Now you were just. Fine. Oh wow! Do you get? There you do, go. There you I don't go. know how, how. Now you got me on audio. I don't know how to get you back on, on video. I, I can see you. I can see you fine. You're, you're you on can video. see me. Yeah, I can well, see you. You're I fine. Can, I can't see you, but how long are we gonna be talking? I'm uh, telling another, you my life story. We probably got another five minutes or so. Okay. Well, this has been good. <laughs> Just a second, Preston. Okay, take your time. My friend's going to help me to get you back. Okay, sure. Ele disse que pode me ver, mas eu não posso ver. 
No. Okay. You see me? It's good enough. Five You're minutes. Good. You're good. Okay. Now I wanted to ask you, um, we we're talking about uh, recordings. I wanted to ask you about your latest recording, if you will. I guess that's going to be released sometime this month, the end of April. And I think you and I had chatted a little bit about that a couple months ago. You have a new recording out. Tell me about, uh, if you will. And I think, didn't you do another rendition of 500 Miles High? Well, that's finally when I got to terms with Chick. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I wouldn't accept that he passed. I wouldn't talk about it. In fact, when hap it happened, uh, my management was receiving hundreds of calls and people that could find me would try to find me in newspapers and TV. And I just wouldn't talk. I couldn't talk. I was hurting yeah. real big. So when I, 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 I was finishing, if you will, which it was a remake of a song that George Duke wrote for me in the late 70s or 80s, I, I realized that I couldn't finish that record without making a tribute to Chick. Yeah. And of course, after the original Return to Forever, he went electric. He, he did the electric band for years and years and years. He went flamenco music, he went Spanish, but he never had a singer again. Right. Yeah, the flamenco dancer, percussionist. But uh, he tried a male singer when I was having a baby. And eight days after my baby was born, he calls me uh, in a, still in a hospital and asked me when I could go back on the road. So I was back there in a minute. Wow. So... That's when I, I'm finishing. This is my last record. I, I just did it. It's not even out yet. Yes. It will be out April 29th. We're all I saw waiting. It. <laughs> it's a good record, you know. I mean, putting it together because through, through the pandemic, the viruses, it was difficult to do that kind of record. It took me a few months to, to pick and choose all the tracks and get them tied together. That's mm -hmm. when I... I decided to, to do 500 miles high. Uh, Are you still there, Preston? I'm still there. I can see and hear you just fine. Yeah. So how do I do 500 miles high different? I first thing I did was something that Chick would hate right away. I changed the key. Because as I told you in the beginning, this song was written for instrumental, not for singers. Yes. It was very high. The key was very high for me to be real comfortable. Mm -hmm. And when I complained with Chick, I said, Chick, this is really high. Let's change. Let's go down a couple of, of, of keys. He said, no. Whenever I write a song, it's already on the key. I want it to, to hear it. Mm -hmm. When I write it, I think of the bass player. I think of the drummer. I said, what about the singer? Well, mm -hmm. you're not supposed to be just a singer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he would never change the keys. So eventually I would show up to check out his new band and stuff. And he would say, you want to sit in? No, I don't want to sit in because I knew he was going to call either yeah. 500 miles high or, or your everything, or what, what game shall we play today? And I said, no, 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 no. Finally, when I decided to redo the song, he wasn't around. I had somebody duplicate exactly the same harmony, two keys lower. So I did it in B flat. Mm. And that's why I am so comfortable now when, I, when you hear it singing 500 miles high and I'm light. I'm not heavy. The drummer is really good and real light, driving, driving good, you know, without any loud, big punches or anything like this, just driving yeah. comfortably. So here I am. I did 500 miles high again. Beautiful. 
beautiful. So the uh, the recording uh, should be out what uh, is it April 29th or something like that or the 28th, something like that. 29th, 29th. Yeah. So after live. today, after today, I I'm going to take a break on the interviews because I've been doing three zooms every day. Oh my goodness. And well, I so don't want to. I don't want to be repetitious and tell the right. same stories because the people that the people that do these shows they read my my files, my biographies, everything I've done, and they kind of ask the same questions different ways, and I I end up telling the same stories. So I need to take a break. Yeah, because the twenty ninth will be a month from now, more or less three weeks. Yeah. Then when the record is out, I know they're gonna want me to rally again, <laughs> possibly go on the road. Yeah. And and do this, do it, you know, with this this music. Well, listen, we eagerly await it, and I want to thank you so much for taking time for being on Jazz Talk today. It's a pleasure, a joy, uh, just to have you on. And uh, hang on, I'm about to close out the show. Don't hang up. Well, you've heard it from the great Flora Perrin. And as the saying goes, if the music grooves and makes you move, it must be jazz. I'm Preston Williams with Jazz Talk signing off. Peace. <laughs>